have the word of God for you, please stand. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 4. In, uh, and in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, we're going to be studying today, continuing on in a, in a series, The Power of God. And we started out with the power of God in creation. And then we took two services to be able to talk about the power of God in mankind. And today, I really could go on for a long time, but I, I, I'm limiting the power of God, His Word, the Word of God, the Bible, today. Uh, but it's a subject that, man, you could really go for a long time. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, it says, Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul, spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this 445. We ask you, Lord, that you'd visit us today. Lord, we just need a refreshing wind to blow through this, this place today. Precious Holy Spirit of God, flow down the pews of this chapel. Have your way with every heart, every man that is here today. Oh, Jesus, may your name have full course and be glorified. I pray, Lord, that you would touch every man that is here today, including this preacher. Lord, they didn't come to hear me preach today, but they've come to hear your word. And I pray today that you fill me with everything you have. And we'll give you all the praise and glory, Jesus. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You, may be, you may be seated. There was a man by the name of A.W. Pink who... Uh, told a story about 30 years ago, and that was back in the old days already. But he said there was a Buddhist monk that was in the temple in, in Tibet, in, uh, and he was in his temple, never heard the gospel, never heard what it meant, didn't know nothing about it. Um, but he ran across as he was cleaning the library one day, somehow or some way there was a, a Gospel of Matthew in there. And so he read it, but yet he didn't quite understand it, but he read it. And there was a lot of questions that was raised into this man because he had read the book of Matthew. And he had heard that there was an evangelist, Christian man, that was running through town. And he snuck out of the temple and he went down to hear him and got saved. But there is something about this word of God, this Bible, that you could speak volumes for. It, there are, are so many, the last 20 years, there's been a different translation almost every year for someone who's trying to translate this word so that it would mean something other than what it means. There's this push for this, that, and the other to make the Bible something that never was intended to be able to do. The Word of God was never intended to make people happy. It was never intended to do the things to, to bring a prosperity to people's souls in the way that we see it these days. But the Word of God, as we read in the Word today, it says, for the Word of God is quick and powerful. And the Word of God is powerful because its author is the Holy Ghost, and he wrote it over the course of many years using many men who had it all flow together over the course of centuries. It is amazing that the Bible has held together. It's been under attack for so many years. And there are so many people that would wish to change it and have it not mean what it means. But the word of God is true and every man a liar. The word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, why is that so? It is because the Word of God is not just a book. It's just not a set of nursery rhymes. It's just not some words that were put on a piece of paper 
but it is the very revelation of God. It is the very word of God. It was inspired by the Holy Ghost, and it is a living word. It's not something that you read and it's dead, but it's alive right now as I read it. It was alive back when it was written, and it will be the living word all the way through to the end of time. And that's why you could read the Word of God. You could understand what the Word of God is saying to your situation right now. You could come back another day. You could read the same passage, the same very passage. And how said, now it's speaking something a little different to you. It's because it's alive. It's a real. And, and because it's alive, it's a real Word of God. It could strike you. And it is sharper than two-edged sword. It pierces even the divining of center of the soul, which is the heart. And it is the feelings. It is the emotions. Mind, will, and, mind, will, and emotions. The soul. It is able to pierce that. And the spirit. And the joints of the marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of every heart. Why? Because the very spirit of God who point pen these words of God and it was inspired and wrote and used meant to be able to write this word of God knows you knows me knows every part of our bodies knows every part of our being knows who we are knows our strength knows our weaknesses knows what we need to hear knows what we need to do and the word of God because it is what it is can go into us because it is alive and then because it's alive it can come into your heart it can come into your soul and it can do the work that God needs it to do in order not only to conform it to the image of God but to bring you into a saving relation with God it knows exactly how to touch your heart. It knows exactly how to speak to your soul on every issue. It knows exactly how to be able to touch you when you need to be touched. It knows how to cheer you. It knows how to comfort you. It knows how to make you glad. It knows how to make you convicted when you sin. It knows how to do everything. And it runs the gamut because it knows you. It knows your heart. And we don't know our own hearts, but the Word of God does. And it says that it is, it even divides the sun of the soul, the spirit, and the joints of the marrow, and it is a discerner and the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It knows exactly, gentlemen, everything that you're going to think from between now and the end of time. And the Word of God will be able to address those things. And it says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You see, you and I think we have these clothes on and we think we are our own man. But God looks at you and I, he sees right through to us. He sees right through to us, to the very heart, the very nature of who we are, and the very substance and essence of who we are. He knows exactly who we are. And he knows exactly what he's got to be able to do with you and I to mold us into the image of his son Jesus. He knows exactly what he's got to do with us. And the word of God is used to be able to do those things. And the word of God discerns those things. The word of God knows what it's going to take. And as you read and as you look to the word of God... It addresses every situation in life. You say, well, there's many things that the, book, the Bible I heard doesn't address. There are some things that are a little vague into the Word of God. I will admit that. But I will tell you, as I read the Word of God, and as I'm in my daily meditation, and as I am just going through my devotions every day, the Word of God speaks very clearly to those issues that it doesn't really speak that loudly about in written form. But I'm just as convicted on those things that are vaguely talked about in the Word of God just as I am the ones that are crystal clear, black and white. I'm just as convicted because the Word of God, as I read my devotions, the Bible will say, what about this? What about that in your life, Mike? What about this? What about that? And the Word of God just as addresses everything about who I am because it knows me. And I'm naked before this Word of God as I'm reading it. As, I, as I'm reading it, it convicts me. And it also lifts the words off the page at me to tell me, Mike, I want your attention on whatever this is that I'm reading. And the Word of God is alive because it's able to do those things. And it's able to speak to your heart. 
And the good news is I've, been, I've talked to saints who've been saved for, a, it seems like forever. Uh, I have a man in my church, he's got saved when he was six years old, he's now in his 80s. He tells me that he still reads the word of God and he has only touched the surface of all of the things and all of the meanings that are in the word of God. Because it's alive. And as long as this man's a sinner, as long as this man is alive, and as long as he's growing in his walk with Christ, and it's going to continue to convict him, it's going to continue to mold him into the image of Christ until the day that he dies. Amen. It takes no vacations. And so it's the word of God, and it's alive. It has its own power. In the, met, the gospel here of John, John 5.24, Jesus said this, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He said, Everyone that hears my word, and you can come into this service today and you can close your ears to what the word of God is trying to say. There's no... There's no way that I could prevent that from coming into your ears to be able to hear. But the word of God, because it's alive, will not return void. I can preach this word. The word of God will come to you. You'll be able to hear the word of God. And you may not do anything with it right now. It may not mean anything to you what I'm preaching right now. But there will come a time and a day when you're by yourself, maybe with somebody else, when all of a sudden the word of God that was spoken at this 445 will come back and rain back into your heart. And you go, wow, I heard some preacher talking about that one time. Because the word of God does not return void. And the word of God that is spoken in John 5, 24, it says, He that heareth my word and believe on him. And Jesus is the word. And he says, He that believeth on me. And so, he that believeth on the Lord Jesus Christ and believes that he is the word, believes that he written the word of God, believes that he came to save sinners, believes that he came to touch those who did not know him came for the poor, came for those that were blind, came to those that could not see. This God, the one who was able to help those that were crippled and those that were less fortunate. This God, this Jesus is the word and he is the very living word. But he says we need to believe on him. We need to believe in his word. We need to believe that he indeed is the Christ. In Psalm 56, Verses 4 through 11. It says, In God I will praise his word. In God I will put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape my iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou in my tears unto my bottle, and they not in thy book. When I cry unto thee, then shall my enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God I will praise his word. In the Lord I will praise his word. You see this word of God is a comfort and it brings a comfort to you because it's not changeable the word of God was true when it was written it is true today and it is going to be true for the end of time the word of God will never change you'll always be able to speak to the issue of the day regardless of what day it's going to be because it's a living book it spoke to the times past at times it took spoke to people all through all the generations. It speaks to us very clearly today. And in the word of God, as we preach it, as we teach it, as we, we speak it, it's as relevant today as it was the day it was written. And it'll always be to the day that it comes to naught. But it's a comfort. Because sometimes you're, when you're in a battle, when you got things coming against you, you don't know if, sometimes if you're coming or going, you've got pressures, you get, you're in a storm. And you wonder, where is the truth? Where, what is the truth? And you wonder, where am I going to find my comfort? 
But where am I going to find an anchor for my soul? Where am I going to be able to find a shelter from the storm? And I tell you, the word of God is true. And, and the devil may come to you, may try to lie to you, and bring thought to your mind, and speak to you the lies that he will try to speak. But the word of God will always be true. The word of God will always speak the truth. And the word of God will always win out over any thoughts of the flesh, any thoughts of the devil, any thing that the enemy will bring to you, the word of God will counter it and the Lord will bring comfort to you. And sometimes, gentlemen, that's all we need. We just need a reality check to know that what we're going through and what we're seeing in front of us and all of the difficulties that we're having has some meaning to it. There's a reason why everything just seems to happen. And, and there is. The Bible speaks to all those things. But the Bible clearly tells me that the Lord God is my strong tower, that he's my refuge, that he's my strength, that he's my buckler, that he's my all in all, that I can trust him and I know he's going to see me through no matter what I go through. And the Bible will comfort you in those ways because it's a surety as to the truth and to everything that it says is backed up verse by verse, every word, every tittle, the word of God is true. And it's wonderful to have a foundation when you know that the word of God will speak to it. And I'm thankful that the Lord gave me his love letter. I'm thankful that the Lord gave me a word that I could meditate on, that I could pray on, that I could say, Lord, what do you have for me today? And start reading his word. And start getting into it and understand that there is something that God is trying to speak to me today. In the beginning of our country, our founding forefathers founded this country on the Bible. It was a Christian nation at the time. And one of the founding forefathers was Patrick Henry. And Patrick Henry said the Bible is worth all the other books which have been printed. And it is it has been my misfortune that I have never found time to read it with the proper attention and feeling till lately. I trust in the mercy of heaven that it is not yet too late. Patrick Henry wrote this, one of our forty forefathers. And you see, the founding forefathers knew the value of the Word of God, knew the value of the Bible, and staked their lives on the very Word of God. Men later on that became and wrote and printed the word of God burned at this very stake for this very word of God. For translating it and putting it into English so you and I could read it and putting it into, into words that you and I could understand, they died at the stake. People died for the very sake, for the very word of God that you are being able to read today. And some of us have three and four Bibles later on our house, and we take it for granted that this is the very Word of God. But we seldom understand the sacrifice that people made in order for us to be able to have the written Word of God, to be able to read it. And there are good versions of the Word of God, and there are some that are okay, and there are some that are just outright horrible. But in everything, the Word of God should be read it should be meditated on, and it should be pondering on it, and you shall let it rule and reign your life. One of the psalms of the Word of God here is Psalm 119, and virtually the whole psalm is about the Word of God. And we just don't have time to read it. I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's over 100 verses. But we know that the Word of God in, in Psalm 119, verse 130 says, says the uh, the entrance of thy word giveth light. The entrance of this word, this very Bible, gives life. And so you, you may be dead in who you are. You may be dead in your sin spiritually. You may not have a spiritual appetite. But the word of God says in Psalm 119, 130, that this very word will give you light will give you an entrance to be able to awaken your soul, awaken your conscience to the very fact that there is a God. But the other things that I like about the Word of God, in Psalm 119 it talks about this is an instruction book. It talks about the Bible as being a guide. 
It's been a resource. Uh, we read that it was a light. It was a comfort. We, we talked about the control, the truth, and the way of life. And the word of God speaks to this and, and a thousand more issues, that we, and a thousand more ways that we don't even have time today. But it's this word of God that gives life. And this word of God, when it gives you life, and it gives you light, you're able to see who you are. And when you read the word of God, it's like looking in a reflection glass. It's like looking in a mirror, and you see yourself through the very word of God. And it points out to you your strengths, and preaches, it points out your, wit, your weaknesses, and it convicts you of the areas that you need to convict. But it also strengthens you, gentlemen. It strengthens you in your time of weakness. It strengthens you in the time of the storm. It strengthens you as you go through about your day. That's right. It reminds you. It reminds you, you know what? I have given my life to the Lord. I am a child of God. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This is not my home. I'm only just passing through as a pilgrim. I'm spending eternity with the Father. I know where I'm headed for. And the word of God will convict, convict, can comfort you and it will convict you. Whatever way it, you need to, for that period of time, it's going to tell you that. And I, I've been convicted many times read the word of God. Michael, you should have done that. Michael, you've got this issue. And then I'm cut to the heart. I'm cut to the heart by the very word of God that I'm reading, the same word that comforted me, the same word of God that gave me so much encouragement and got me so excited also convicts me. But gentlemen, the good news is this, that the very word of God that brings a conviction upon your heart, when you read the word of God, will also show you a way to deal with it and help you to overcome. The Lord is not a killjoy. He's just not going to bring a conviction in your life and just let you hang there and say, well, I guess you guys uh, got it going now. No, the Lord wants you to see you overcome. He has your best intentions in mind, your best in his thoughts. And he wants you to overcome, so he brings a conviction. But in that conviction, there's always a way out. There's always a way to overcome whatever that is that's in your life. And the Word of God will speak to those issues. It will help you. It will under, it help you to understand all that is written. And now, somebody will come up and they'll say, well, what about all those supposed contradictions that are in the word of God you know we hear that there's plenty of those and uh, it's interesting that whenever I get somebody to ask me the question uh, first of all they most of the time they don't know what the contradictions are because they never read the word of God but even if they did read the word of God and even if they were knowledgeable and even if they thought there were supposed contradictions, there is an explanation, gentlemen, for every contra supposed contradiction that's in the word of God. And there's books written on those to be able to explain those. And some of that is well beyond what my mind can grasp or understand, but I get it when I read the, when I get why they are what they are. And it's not that difficult to understand. It takes it takes digging is what it takes and it takes a little more investigation of what you're reading and you'll get it and that's how I was able to, to be able to do it when you read something it, it looks like it's a, well this is a contradiction to the word of God boy this, that's not what the other verse that's what the, uh, the other guy was saying well if you, you study it you know, and you dig deep you find out it's the same thing and so there's really no there is no supposed contradictions and it is the word of God in 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the, pri for the prophecy came not of old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, the Word of God lines up perfectly and runs through the course perfectly because the same Holy Spirit of God used different men to be able to write the Word of God. He took their talents, he took their knowledge, and he took their writing abilities. But no man wrote anything in this Word of God that was contrary to the to Holy Ghost, what he gave them to write. And it all lines up. And I couldn't find two men, even if I loved a brother dearly, even if I had a dear brother, and, and him and I were to write the same thing, we would never even write the same thing the same. 
And if I had a brother that said, well, I want you to write the sermon, I'm going to write the sermon, we'll both write the sermon, and we'll see how it turns out, even that wouldn't be the same. As much as I love the brother, and even as much as I lo love the passage. But under the direction of the Holy Ghost, you could have men through the course of many years, all having the Word of God line up, because it's the same Holy Spirit that gave the first person the information that they needed, and they were moved by the Holy Ghost up to the last person that wrote. And it all lines up just perfectly because it's the Word of God. It changes not. It is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I know that the devil will put anything in his way to get you to stop reading the Word of God so that you would not read it. He'll put difficulties and, and time things and all sorts of things that come in your life so you don't read the Word of God. But the very Word of God is food for your souls. This Word of God is food. And you need meat and potatoes to live when you go upstairs and eat. For your soul and for you to live spiritually, this Word of God has to be chewed up. And the only way you can do it is by reading it. There's just no other way. And there are countries around this world and there are people who suffer and die for the sake of this gospel. And there are people who die and would love to have a whole Bible. And in China, many times there are home churches. And uh, if you read Voice of the Martyrs, that magazine will explain a lot to you. But if, if there's a church and if they've got one or two pages of the Word of God, some of them are lucky to have that. And somebody will write down that, that page and they'll pass it along to someone else and they'll pass it along to someone else. They don't, I don't even have the whole Bible. And, and they're reaching out and they, and they wish they had that. And they don't. And here we have this whole Word of God. We know the beginning from the end. We have Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. If you get a chance, there is a book called The Heavenly Man. And it was written by a Chinese pastor um, years ago. And in this book he wrote of the time when he got saved. He thought he was called to preach. And, and obviously at that time it was illegal to have a Bible in that country, in the country of China. And so he heard from someone, well he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And he heard that there was some man that before the Communist Party took over, there was a man somewhere that had a Bible. And he went two days to go to be able to reach out to this man with his mother in order to be able to have the Word of God. He just wanted to see what the Bible looked like. That's all he wanted. He wanted to see what it looked like. All he heard was stories of the wonderful Bible. And he knew he was called to preach, and he knew that he needed the Word of God to be able to preach, but he's missing the Bible. And so he goes to the man, and the man turns him away for fear of getting called up by the communists. And in, in those days, they could kill you for having the Bible. And so he didn't blame the guy for not showing him the Bible. But eventually, he got a hold of one. And as he read the Word of God, he talked about how it transformed his life. How it made him no longer into this man who just knew God. But it turned him into a man that knew of God. And it turned him into the very images of Christ. Or day by day by day it continually showed him. And continually convicted him. And it continually turned him into the image of Christ. And when he died he didn't mature. Obviously to the point where all the dross was taken off. But he matured to the point where he understood the Word of God. And he was so excited to be able to read the Word of God because it meant so much to him. And because he was living in a communist country and, he, and people were coming to the droves to, to salvation and knowing Jesus Christ, he continually read the Word of God, continually conveyed it to these people that were in his church and wherever he traveled. And the Word of God was used to be able to comfort people in their time of distress, to be able to assure them that their salvation was real, to let them know that this is not all there was to life, but there was an afterlife. There was an eternal life. 
And when they accepted Christ, they, get, they entered into eternal life to spend eternity with God. And although they suffered many things, many of his parishioners died, went to prison, was tortured for all the, for just being a Christian. He continually talked of how the word of God strengthened him, strengthened the parishioners, strengthened the people, that even when they were being tortured, even when they were going through the most horrific things in, the, in, in life, yet this word of God, this word of God was drawing them strength. Why? Because it's not a dead book. It's a living book written and inspired by the Holy Ghost. And it is what it is. It's living, it's alive, and it's active. It's the Word of God. We read in the book of, in the book of Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3.16, probably familiar it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So everything in this word of God is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all works. And you see, the scriptures is not only a book of inspiration by God, but it is profitable to teach doctrines and beliefs how to run your lives, how to, what, to, what to have for a foundation for your life. And it also is good for reproof. It's good for correction. If you're, if you're not thinking straight, if you're not lining up with the Word of God, if your mind is not where it should be, the Word of God will correct it for you. It gets you to think the way you need to be thinking. And I don't know about you, but my, my mind drifts like anybody else's. I, I try to stay at course, but it just drifts. And so I need this. But it is, it, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You want to know how to live. You want to know how to be a godly man. And you want to know how you can be the best man for God. And if you want to know how to do God's will, you want to know how to rest in God's will and make it happen in your life, read the word. It'll instruct you. And finally, in the book of the Revelation, in Revelation 22, 18, some words of warning. It says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of the book, if any man shall add unto this thing, God shall add unto him the plague that is written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of his holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The word of God is serious. And the God that wrote this word is serious about his word. Different manuscripts were used to write different versions in, the, in doing its interpretation. And that's maybe a Bible study for another time. But the word of God is inspired by God. God honors its content. God honors exactly how it is written. And it is profitable it is of good value for you and I if we adhere to what the Word of God says and we do it. Let's pray.